thank you all and I think uh, I don't need to make a presentation because you heard the story already but let me talk about what I think is going to happen and why ONDC beckon are so strategic and important for us and I call this going from micro to mega. Now we know what's happening in the world, things are getting hotter, people are getting older and we have all the geopolitics, near shoring, friend shoring, this, that and the other. So the world has obviously become far more complicated than ever before. And India is particularly in a good position. We all accept every week we have a visitor telling us about this is going to be India's century. And we know we have the young population. We have, uh, we have uh, you know, uh, the tech revolution and so on. But if you actually look at the market, India has huge variations in industries, in cultures, in industrial regions. So really we have a lot of small, small micro markets. Even in language, for example, it's almost impossible to find someone who can speak the same language, which is why we use linked languages like English and Hindi. Now what is going on, which we talked about DPIs, is India is going from an offline, informal, low productivity micro economy, that means many, many small economies, to a single online, formal, high productivity mega economy. And that is the transition that is happening uh, in front of us. We saw that with banking. Normally, it would have taken 47 years for us to achieve banking penetration of 80% financial accounts. We did that in nine years, thanks to Aadhaar, KYC, and all the things we talked about. Now, all this is possible because of a whole set of what is now globally accepted as digital public infrastructure. This is essentially building blocks at population scale, all of which do one thing, but they all interoperate and create magical combinations. So we have digital IDs and registries like Aadhaar and so on. We have the whole infrastructure for trust, digital signatures, public key, private key, and so on, all of that to ensure that we can trace something back to its origin. Or we have the ability to use data. Data can be used as data empowerment. You saw the privacy bill being passed yesterday. Data Privacy Bill talks about consent managers, and so it's actually officially legally now we have the infrastructure for data empowerment, and then of course data for AI, and then credentialing. One of the things we all carry around is our vaccination certificate in DigiLocker. That's a credential that was issued to a billion people. And then of course we have seen the revolution in payments, not just uh, UPI, but our DBT, our direct benefit transfer, is one of the la world's largest uh, transfers in the world. And then we have something new coming, which I'll talk about. Now, it's very clear that the DPIs so far have had huge impact. And she talked about it, how everything we do is affected. But look at the volumes. Every one of them is about billions of transactions, billions of IDs, you know, billions, trillions of dollars. So clearly, this has had scale benefits for everyone. And we saw that with, uh, you know, not only for normal situations, but even for abnormal situations, when we had to take the vaccination, we, India was able to do 2.2 billion vaccinations in two years because we had the infrastructure of COIN and vaccination certificates to make it happen at scale. So what we did, basically there are three things. One is creating digital infrastructure at population scale, small value transactions, uh, sachet sized, using policy to create an ecosystem to make all this happen, for example, the UPI policy puts the framework for multiple players to participate. And then unleashing public and private innovation on top. And the combination of DPI, the fact that we have 100,000 startups, and the fact that we have the technology talent, which has been built over the last 40 years, has created all these enormous combinations that are happening all the time. Now, what is going to come next? And what is it that we can do? And that is really what can we do for the transaction economy. What can we do for buying and selling? And this is really the heart of what's coming. And as Nitin mentioned, this is going to be a very big idea, and it has huge possibilities that we all have to think about. Now, in India, actually all our markets are essentially fragmented. You know, we talk a lot about this and that, but actually when you go into the details, as I mentioned, only 5-6% of our MSMEs sell on platforms. Most of our trucks are owned by small truck operators, right? 85% the, the of the trucks are owned by people who own less than five trucks. So it's massive. 
our retail. I, I was talking to some of the biggest people in grocery, and they said even five years from now, seven years from now, 80, 90 percent of grocery is still going to be sold by the small guy. It's not going to be on a platform because it's going to be expensive to do these things on a platform. Mobility, we do 100 million daily trips. Less than 6 million are on, 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 a, on a platform. So what we are finding is that while there are platforms and they have made a big difference, they actually are a very small part of what is possible because the structure of this is through the platform route. Now what happens in, in, in this is that different platforms or aggregators happen in different areas, but they only cover a small part of it. I talked about how mobility is only 6% of the vehicle uh, rides are on, on, on a platform. But the large number of players, whether the trucks, the cars, the goods, they are excluded from this because there is no simple way to discover what to buy or what to order from whom and there is certainly no way to make the fulfillment happen. And fulfillment could be fulfillment for services, fulfillment for products, it could be different kinds of fulfillment. It's not possible to do that in an interoperable manner. And that is what open networks like ONDC do, is they essentially allow you to open up everyone to participate. In other words, these interoperable networks operate at population scale. They are inclusive, they're not exclusive. Everybody can participate, the small guy can participate. All the small guy has to do is to hook into the, the grid in some sense with this protocol which as so whether a small retailer who wants to do hyperlocal commerce, whether you're a specialist supplier of toys, you want to, you can all plug into this. And therefore it's an inclusive way of doing things. And that is what leads to market expansion. We saw that in the, in the UPI business. UPI created an interoperable network. Before UPI, it took us 75 years to reach six or seven million point of sale machines in India. In a matter of four years, we have gone to 50 million merchants who accept UPI payments. Now, why is that? Because UPI was an interoperable payment system, and the QR code of UPI was interoperable. So no matter which app I use, I could use PhonePay, Google Pay, Paytm, Beam, whatever, I could pay at a merchant because the UPI code was, was interoperable to everybody, which is why today we have 350 million people doing 9.66 billion transactions a month, at 50 million merchants. It's happened because of the architecture and the thought behind creating an interoperable interconnected network. And this is what is going to happen. And this also moves the autonomy at the nodes because every the person who's at the edge of this node participates as an equal. He's not depending on some aggregator in between. And this can be done at different times. So you can join this asynchronously. And of course, all kinds of innovation are possible. We talked about uh, Indian language. Today we have the whole Bhashini project, which is going to create an open source library of, uh, you know, and an LLM for Indian language. Now, you can use that and put that into the node of uh, ONDC client so that people can order using voice in their own language. So, platforms have basically combined all these functions. Discovery, ordering, fulfillment, post-fulfillment like returns or so, anything else. What open networks do is take this same journey but unbundle the journey into individual components. So discovery can be done in one place, order can be placed there, fulfillment can be done by somebody else, and the return processing can be done by somebody else. Now this is a very, very strategic thing because nobody in the world has unbundled and created population scale, interoperable protocols to make discovery and fulfillment happen in a disaggregated manner, where multiple actors can come together, and because they all speak the same language, because they all use the same protocol, they can all talk to each other. This is a whole new idea, which is that we, 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 we understand how to do fulfillment discovery, but we think of them as monolithic platforms, but not as something that cuts across and brings different people together. And this, all this is done using this protocol Beacon. I think later on you'll hear more about Beacon and how it's evolving as a protocol for discovery and fulfillment for the, at population scale. 
And you saw that, and this is, of course, the report that Nitin also mentioned, the McKinsey report, which essentially said that if you implement this well, you'll have a 5x increase in digital consumption of products and services. You'll have a 4x increase in active e-commerce users. And you'll have a 7x increase of MSMEs in commerce. So all this is a direct consequence of unbundling and unlocking the ability of everyone to play in e-commerce by creating an open protocol for discovery and fulfillment. We saw that with Namayatri. I think they're maybe talking later. Namayatri has done 100 crores of earnings since launch in November 22. This is just in a few months. And this is doing 80,000 trips a day. That means already 80,000 times in a day, somebody is hailing uh, auto on the Namayatri app. The auto is coming, he's making the deal, and he's making a direct payment to the auto. There's no, no one in between. So the auto driver gets 100% of the payment. And this is something which uh, I'm sure the guys are here. And there are already 1.6 million users in Bangalore registered on this platform. And there are 85,000 drivers. There's not even any. There's no CAC and spending money. Getting, and none of that is happening. It's all happening by word of mouth. So you can see that if you use this infrastructure, you use this new technology and create companies, they will attract customers because it's fundamentally changing the way business models operate. Now, going forward, of course, we have commerce is the big thing, and you'll hear more about it from Koshi and others. But we believe that the Beckon protocol can be used for many things beyond commerce. Nitin talked about Honest, which is a network for education, skilling, and jobs. So basically, everybody can discover a job on the network. Fulfillment can happen. They can show their credentials and so on. So this whole thing is getting done for skills, jobs, and, and so on. But a very, very important area where Beckon and this uh, protocols are going to happen is in the area of the green economy. Remember when we began, we said the world is getting hotter and older. Tomorrow, the way energy is going to be in the world is going to be very different. Today, we think of energy as huge plants that produce uh, you know, electricity, thermal power plants, or whatever. And they all feed into the grid, and you get the power. But tomorrow, you're going to have a decentralized network. You're going to have thousands of windmills, thousands of solar panels. You'll have some large solar plants. You'll have rooftop solar. Every, every vehicle will have a battery. Every bus will have a battery. Every truck will have a battery. And every one of these has to be charged. So there's a whole charging to be done. And every one of these can also be a storage from which you can pull out energy in, at the right time. So everything can be bidirectional. So if you want to have a bidirectional network of energy with thousands of nodes, how do you do that? The only way you can do that is by having an interoperable protocol. So a very strong use case of Beckon is actually in the energy space where you can combine thousands of batteries and they all can pull energy from the grid. They can put it back in the grid based on the, on the dynamic uh, loads and so on. And this is something very important. Similarly, this pr protocol can be used for creating an interoperable charging network. The challenge we have in these new areas is there are no standards. So you'll have every, every guy who's making vehicles will put his own charging network with his own standards. And everybody will have to have different apps to uh, you know, discover the, where you can charge. With a Beckon kind of protocol, you can have anyone can go and charge anywhere and just connect and start charging. That is something that suddenly that means, like UPI, the addition of QR code to one merchant, any app could use. Tomorrow, the addition of a charging station to the charging network, any vehicle can charge. So that suddenly opens up the power of creating a charging, a network of charging density. Or you could use it for warehousing, as I said. You can store the energy in the batteries, or 10,000 batteries can store, and they can all feed it back. And the another important part of the green economy is how do we enable reuse? How do we enable a circular economy? How do you get things back? And therefore, you have the full infrastructure on ONDC, for example. You can have complete reverse logistics. So just like you have the logistics of delivering from a product supplier to the consumer, you can have the reverse for, you know, 
uh, you know, management of uh, produ uh, if a producer is responsible for all the stuff, the packaging, you can send it back through the ONDC network. So you can create all kinds of circular economy possibilities because the fundamental infrastructure allows you to think of combinations like this. So I talked earlier about IDs and trust and signatures, data and payments. So what we have is the fifth leg or the fifth pillar of DPI, which enables discovery and fulfillment. Now, we are used to discovery, but we are now doing discovery across suppliers, across products. And fulfillment is a very complex thing. How do you make fulfillment happen? How do you make sure when a customer orders something that they get the satisfaction across multiple players? So the, the protocols required to make that are extremely sophisticated. You have to deal with all kinds of edge cases to make that happen. But all that has been built and is ready for use. And therefore, and this will only get better because there's a whole community which is building these protocols and you can take advantage of that. So really now we have a whole new way of doing things with discovery and fulfillment. As we said, DPI is only as useful as the applications built on it. And we have seen this movie before. The Aadhaar KYC was launched by us in 2012 or 2013, whatever, 2012. Nobody used it. They, they, nobody said, what is this? I, you know, we tried to get people to use it, but it got used in the mobile industry only in 2016 because Jio came in and said, we want to get to 100 million customers in six months. And the only way they could get to 100 million customers in six months was by enrolling 1 million customers a day. And the only way they could get 1 million customers a day was using Aadhaari KYC and issuing a SIM connection in two minutes. And fundamentally, they took eKYC and popularized it in the mobile industry. Similarly, Aadhaar KYC for banks was done either because of government mandate, like the Prime Minister Jhandan Yojana program, or by new private players, Paytm Payments Bank, IDFC Bank, all the new banks were the first to use. So what we have found in our digital journey is that when we create these DPIs, the people who adopt them are the people who are new to the game, the people who have no baggage, who want to take it forward. We saw that with UPI when people like PhonePay came along, Google Pay came along and used it and created these multi-billion dollar companies using this new infrastructure. So whenever we have these DPIs, it is up to companies who are not conflicted or who do not have any baggage to embrace these technologies and create very successful companies on top of this by various. And they, today, ONDC and Beckon are at this point, at this juncture, where they're all ready for prime time. And now it's up to the great innovators in this room to build on top of that.